people can keep joining us. Okay, so officially kia ora, Dr. Smith. <laughs> Say hello to you once again. And uh, with your permission, I'm going to start uh, the session with your introduction for the audience today. So today we have with us uh, one of the world's leading scholars and founding thought leaders of indigenous studies, indigenous education and Kao Papa Maori research. And please tell me, tell me if I pronounce something incorrectly. Uh, Professor Tuhiwai Smith, who is particularly known for her groundbreaking book, Decolonizing Methodologies, Research and Indigenous Peoples. Uh, it is known as the mother of indigenous studies and it is considered one of the most influential texts of indigenous research. And according to Google, as I was just sharing uh, a while ago, um, uh, the book has been cited 20,740 times. Yeah, so Dr. Smith is a professor of Maori and indigenous studies at University of Waikato in New Zealand. She has held a number of senior positions at both the University of Waikato and the University of Auckland. She's a member of the White Tangi Tribunal. She's a fellow of the American Educational Research Association, a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand, and she was awarded a Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit. Professor Smith is one of the first Maori women to become a fellow of the Royal Society, and she's received the Prime Minister's Lifetime Achievement Award for education, as well as an honorary doctorate in Canada. Her books, articles, and YouTube videos are prescribed texts in universities all around the world. She is the daughter of Sir Hirini Moko and June Mead and is married to Professor Graham Hingaga Roa Smith. She has two beautiful daughters, Ramari Jackson and Kaupua Smith. Dr. Smith, it is an absolute pleasure and an honor to have you with us today. And uh, I cannot actually convey the excitement we felt when we, fe when we got your positive response, you know, the kind when your heart does a little dance for joy. And so thank you so much for joining us. And your support is really helpful in making, in bringing more meaning uh, and, uh, you know, making the experience of reading this book uh, real for all of us. So thank you so much. And we, before we move on to the question and answer session, I would like to introduce our professor for this course um, on qualitative methods in educational research, Dr. Tamara Burton and Jones. Dr. Burton and Jones is an associate professor of higher education in Department of Educational Research and Policy Studies at Florida State University. She also serves as associate department chair and associate director for the Center of uh, for Pro Secondary Success. And she's the kind of teacher who always strives to bring out the best in her children. And we are really uh, you know, lucky to have her as our teachers. Thank you so much, Dr. Bernard jo Burton and Jones. Would you like to say something? D just thank you, Dr. Smith, so much for your time. Um, I am grateful and, and awed at our students for reaching out to you and then you agreeing to say yes. So we are also um, very grateful to have you here. Um, and we just appreciate your time. So thank you for sharing with us. Would you like to briefly describe the, the nature of the activity that we uh, are engaged in here? Sure. Um, you know, in teaching this um, qualitative research methods class, there are so many um, resources, so many books, so many perspectives to be shared. And um, we, I thought about this book review I wanted the students to do a book review, wanted to challenge them to read something that aligned with their interest, but I didn't want it to be just a traditional, you know, you read the book by yourself and you give me a report on this book review. So this group book review was something that was shared. There's a, a Facebook group, Qualitative Research in Education, and um, one of the posts talked about this interesting assignments. And so the book review, book group, was one of those assignments. And so we thought we'd try it here. And as, as of right now, it's been a success <laughs> if we just use this one group's um, work. So we're excited to see what this group and others who are reading other, other books, what they come up with. But thank you, we appreciate your time and look forward to all that you have to share with us today. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Burton and Jones. Uh, could the um, book club members please introduce themselves now? Kate, you want to go first? 
Sure. Um, so my name is Kate Shell, and I'm. Uh, this is my second semester at Florida State. I'm doing the PhD in international and multicultural education, um, and I'm from the U.S. I'm from Florida, and um, my my work for the last six or seven years has mostly been in the Philippines. I was living in the Philippines before this, um, and working with um, different non dominant language communities and some indigenous language communities um, on developing materials to incorporate their languages um, in the public education system. I can go next. Hi, Dr. Smith. My name is Amok Basavaraj. And like Kate, I'm also in the International and Multicultural Education Program in the second semester as a doctoral student. I'm interested in teacher professional development in developing countries. I'm from India and my research is also likely to be in India, but I've also worked in African countries and that's essentially what I focus on. I can go next. Uh, hello, Dr. Smith. Uh, my name is Anairis de la Cruz Benito and I have two of me because I am from Mexico. <laughs> And we have a father and mother last name. And this is my second year at Florida State University. And I'm doing my doctoral program in mathematics education. And compared to others, I don't think I have that much experience. I just worked one year in Mexico as a middle school math teacher. And um, yeah, that was it. And then I came to, to Florida. Okay, <clears throat> hello. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Smith. It's honestly a privilege to have you here today. Um, my name is Jonathan French. I'm also in my second semester in the PhD program for international and multicultural education. I'm also from Florida, but uh, most of my education work has actually been in the former Soviet Union, uh, the Republic of Moldova and Azerbaijan, where I worked with language pedagogy and specifically academic language preparation for post-secondary. Thank you. And if I might say so myself, last but not the least, I'll introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Ambar Noor Mustafa. I am from Pakistan. I'm in the second semester of my doctoral program, and I'm also uh, studying international and multicultural education. I've been with the field of education for the past 18 years, working with uh, students and then teachers and with school leaders. My interest in uh, research is in uh, access to education to the masses in my country, because I know access to education is a major problem there. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, we will now begin um, our um, question and answer uh, session. Uh, so the first question is that uh, the, the, uh, the tone of this book is definitely very bold. And you, know, it, you have set out your message in a very, very vivid and uh, tone. And if I might read from one of the reviews at the back of the book, decolonizing methodologies remains persuasive, evocative, and enduring, and inspirational for sure. So Dr. Smith, uh, would you like to share your journey which led you to the book and uh, where did you take your inspiration from? <laughs> wow. Well, firstly, greetings, everybody. And, and greetings in these unusual times. Um, and I just want to acknowledge where everyone is and I hope you're all well and keeping yourselves well. And I know what it means to study in isolation and be alone um, and encourage you to, you know, look after the wholeness of yourself, not just your intellectual self, but take care of your take care of your emotional, spiritual, um, physical, collective self identity and, and spend some time doing that purposefully rather than accidentally. And I think that will make your studies, you know, fulfilling. As a, as a teacher, I, I would also say your studies aren't actually the most important thing every day, every moment, uh, being you and being well is, and your studies should help you do that. So there is an intellectual healthy life and actually most intellectuals are really bad role models for how to live a balanced life. 
and my students always used to ask me, how do you like maintain a balance between work and life, you know, work and home? And it's like, that's just not a question my generation never had to think about, like work is life. That's how we were brought up, work is life. Um, and it's the particular generation post Second World War where you did have to work hard and find joy in work. But I know from my daughter's generation, um, it's not quite the same. And the conditions for happiness are different. So I think how you make yourselves happy is, is really important. All right, so greetings um, to all of you and thank you for the invitation. Um, so in terms of the book, it, it does have a bit of a, um, a journey, my own journey as a student, and you will see that in some of the chapters in the book and my own, um, I guess, alienation from what I was reading. The absence, um, not, partly the absence of tools and ideas that were really helpful to me, but um, the, just the total um, colonial defining of who I was, you know, what that meant as, a, as an individual, let alone a people or community to, to open texts and have your whole um, sense of being um, sort of negated by the way others authorized you. And, you know, that, that was my struggle as an undergraduate. To be honest, most of my undergraduate studies, um, there were no indigenous anything, there was nothing. Um, and this is in New Zealand. We study, I studied history, it was British imperial history, how wonderful the British were. And um, you know, then I did geography, it was imperial geography, how great they were. And it emphasized all these um, discourses around discovery, you know, European enlightenment. And even as an undergraduate student, and, and I'm talking about a time when most of you were not born, but it was the civil rights movement in the US in the late 1960s. It was the birth of the American Indian movement. And I was part of the sort of radical Maori sovereignty movement here. So that was in the late 1960s, and that was for me an awakening. Um, I think I learned more value sitting in the student cafeteria with my friends, reading uh, Franz Fanon and other revolutionary texts. And, you know, we would uh, hunger for the words of Malcolm X and, you know, debate them about whether they were relevant to us or not relevant and all the time searching for connections to people like us to indigenous people so that was happening while I was also being a history student and then a political study student um, I abandoned geography quite early and and then I went um, teaching trained as a teacher and you know when I looked at my students I chose to teach in areas where mostly Māori and Pacific students I could just see like the next generation and the next generation being taught the same um, bullshit really about who they were or not being taught anything about who they were and a, a total denial that they existed. And so all those ideas came together when I, um, I was sent by the government to, like paid by the government to um, do a degree in counselling, which I hated. And I, went, I ran away from counselling classes and psychology classes and went and studied or snuck into the sociology classes and sort of gradually started to 
shift my focus and and then you know it was a paper like what you're doing it was a research feminist research paper where many of the ideas that are partly in the book started to come together and you know actually getting to do some research and thinking through you know what what it means when you actually after learning all this stuff you go out and you think right I'm going to you know how exciting I'm going to interview some people and in that process you find lots of things subtly change you change like you dress up you get prepared the people who you know on a day-to-day life they change they dress up they prepare and it was really through the actual doing research that I sort of finally put it together and then in the PhD I did more of this sort of history of the enlightenment and of the first part of the book really was a large chunk of what was in my PhD and I knew as I was writing the PhD that I wanted to write a book specifically about Indigenous methodologies and um, as soon as I finished the PhD which was in education I just completely restructured um, part of the PhD to form the first part of the book and then I wrote from chapter five onwards those all those were new chapters and I wrote them in six months because they'd been sort of forming in my mind and sort of came together while I was writing the PhD because my PhD could have been like thousands of pages and three volumes but I had a fabulous set of supervisors who said wait till after the PhD and made me jettison a whole lot of what I thought was fabulous and um, just go no out 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 and um, finish the PhD and then get on to doing the things that um, you want to do afterwards so that's just a bit of advice to you so that's a long-winded answer Um, came together partly the reflection of the context of the times the sovereignty movements what was going on for me and then trying to connect what you learn and then go into doing research that the act of being a researcher kind of forces these critical reflections and um you know I just knew that if I was to continue as a researcher it needed to be in a different kind of paradigm thank you for that response uh, Dr. Smith Um, now getting a little bit more into the book uh, you say in your foreword that chapter 11 was part of a research project with colleagues and that you you took your research ideas out to communities to for critique and then con- uh, subsequently made revisions based on the feedback you received uh, what was the main feedback of that chapter in particular and your book in general and how have you engaged with that feedback um Okay, so the chapter you're referring to is the mar- choosing the margins. That chapter, is that the one? Remember chapter eleven. I'm, I'm asking yes. questions with yes. somebody else. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, this yeah. is choosing okay. the margins, chapter eleven. Yeah. Um, yeah, that so that was a sort of about a two and a half year project. It's hard to sort of pick one thing out and say the feedback resulted in this change because it was not that kind of process. It was just an ongoing discussion, thinking, discussion, thinking, sharing ideas, um, further discussion and feedback about, you know, what worked. And then and then obviously grappling with the literature and, and um, you know, just there's a lot in the black feminist literature around, you know, what it means to live and work in the margins, um, to be in these spaces, and in the end to embrace these spaces and understand um, what it means to do that. 
and you know and thinking about that for myself yeah I think you're taught in the mainstream to fear margins but if you live in the margins that is your home and so when you live in the margins you you make a culture in the margins and it's a loving you know for the most part and it's often seen as a violent culture you know from the sort of because the margins are feared they're the outsiders uh, whereas I think if you live in a lot of marginalized communities they create cultures that care that's that are resilient that try to try to survive in the best ways possible for human beings they build stories um, they eat really cool food out of rubbish nutrients you know they they can cook out of not much and that's what I grew up appreciating that um you know, out of a few humble ingredients, they can make the most glorious food. So the margins are not to be feared. And those who live in the margins, I think one of the dilemmas for people like me or Indigenous or people of colour who come into the university, come into sort of academic studies, is a process of assimilation into that world where you start to see the margins as somehow to be feared, even though you come from there. And I think as a researcher, you know, you are taught explicitly to think like an outsider, to explicitly distance yourself and look at, observe, listen to these other voices that are distant from you. And you can't do that in the kind of mar marginal spaces that we might call home. You have relationships with them. They, um, they want to touch you, for example. They want to feed you. They want, they want to nourish you. And you want to do that too, because it's reciprocal. And so I think the dilemmas for researchers is, you know, well, no, I'm a researcher, I've got to act like this. And I know for many of my colleagues, it puts them in these tricky positions. And I think what that chapter basically says, you know, don't, don't fuss about artificial kind of identities that are imposed on you. Just embrace where you've come from, who you are and where you work. And, and I'll, I'll put it to you another way. You know, as a teacher, I got to teach all the naughty children and they often had names like F block, C block, or, you know, J class. And I'd go to the staff room at, for lunch and other teachers would speak to me as if I myself was a pupil of J block, like they would speak very slowly, like I was thick. So they associate the teacher even, you know, with the students. And that's often what happens in research is you, you know, there are these associations and you've got to um, learn how to push back on that, but also understand that nothing you can do really or the energy you spend in trying to prove to them that you're like them is a waste of time and energy. It's a waste of your time and energy. Don't spend your time trying to prove you are like a white researcher from a dominant class, group, whatever. You, you can't do that. Be yourself. Iris, you want to take the next question? Sure. Um, I am going to start with a specific question. <laughs> and 
My question, well, I have to say first that I am indigenous too. And when I was reading this book, it was like really touching and thoughtful, like feeling like, uh, oh, like there are people that care about indigenous community. And so my question, uh, well, I, I wanna say like, uh, I love that you identify yourself as, as an indigenous researcher. And I perceive that the book is written with an indigenous audience in mind. And so we know like nowadays, um, the uh, native language uh, are kind of becoming lost because a uh, younger generation no longer want to speak in their mother tongue. For instance, uh, in my hometown, we do speak a Mosco, which is my native language. And so I remember when I was a kid, like we speak in a Mosco all the time and we were like really focusing on learning Spanish. And nowadays it's the opposite. Like uh, my nieces and nephews, no one of them speak a Mosco. Now they speak Spanish. And we really want to try then to speak uh, a Musco. We don't want to lose our 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 native language. And so my question is like uh, uh, regarding like if you have any suggestion recommendation on how to preserve uh, this native language in indigenous communities. Well, the story of language revitalization in New Zealand is is actually a really amazing story, a 30, 40 year story of revitalization, which actually began with an idea that came from Mexico. Uh, one of our senior Māori leaders saw an early childhood center in Mexico somewhere uh, where they were immersing the children in the indigenous language. And he sort of saw the possibilities of that and came back to New Zealand and suggested you know, that we designed something similar. And out of that was the language nests were born. And these were um, early childhood um, nests, if you like, groupings of native speakers and children. Our native speakers were older because our language was seen as dying. Um, and there was an the late 1970s. And so that movement really became the fastest early childhood movement in New Zealand. And um, people just flocked to it because the vision of saving our language was a community vision. And it united everybody, it didn't matter what their politics were, everyone loved our language. And so from that has been, with we've developed um, primary schools, an alternative primary school movement called Kura Kaupapa Māori. We have secondary schools, we have Māori television, Māori news, newspapers, Māori media, social media. Um, it's basically blossomed to this larger revitalization efforts. And um, so what am I saying? Now you can, we can see our young people love our language to the extent that they've taken it into their lives and embraced it, and they're proud to speak Māori language. They, by being speakers of the language, they've been able to create popular music. Um, they speak it in sports um, contexts and you know, basically the fullness of their lives, they can and do speak the language. So I think, so if we sort of step back from that, what does it mean? I mean, the community, people in the community kind of have to love their language and understand the power of it. And then the investment and the revitalization part is really the most challenging, the most difficult. Uh, in terms of finding speakers and who are willing to invest in learners who are going to learn. And then you've got to trust that those who have been immersed in the language will begin to use that language to express themselves in the world. And, and that's the hardest thing to see when you're starting out, that 
by speaking a language, they inherently have different qualities, different aspirations, and they can do different things with the language. Um, one of the challenging things for, for us was the older generation were shocked, you know, that the younger generation sort of created a popular language. They didn't speak like traditional elders. They took it into contemporary spaces. Um, I remember we had big arguments about, you know, should we translate, um, what was it? Popular TV program, um, Ninja Turtles. Should we translate Ninja Turtles into Māori language? And while we were busy arguing about it as adults, the children had invented their own language for it. So they had done their own translation. And, and that's the power of the language is it drives a kind of creativity as people, as this next generation, but it's their language. It'll be their language. It won't be the language of the elders. It's the language of the generation who speak it. And um, yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard road. We, we, we would still not claim our language is healthy, but along the way, we've gained a great deal of support. It is taught in all schools in New Zealand. Um, it's accompanied now by a, a compulsory New Zealand history curriculum. And there is an aim to make New Zealand, you know, bilingual, at least in the indigenous language and English. That's interesting. Thank you. Suggestions. I wanted to ask, um, recognizing that the book is is written to an Indigenous audience and for Indigenous researchers, but as um, someone who has collaborated with Indigenous researchers and but is myself not Indigenous, I'd wanted to ask a little bit about, um, you know, considerations and advice that you would give for those of us who want to support and lift up. Um, partners and collaborators in Indigenous communities. And you have some of that in the book, but just thinking, you know, 10 years have passed since this edition of the book and the world is always changing and um, globalization is affecting so many different things. So what um, additions or modifications would you give maybe to that um, advice for those of us who are not Indigenous ourselves, but want to be um, a part of supporting and empowering um, research around Indigenous knowledges and development of Indigenous communities? Well, there's always a space for allies, accomplices, collaborators, but I was very purposeful to write my book clearly with a clear sort of message to Indigenous communities, Indigenous peoples. And I did, I thought about that really purposefully. Um, thought it was very important that I aim at one audience, knowing that's an extremely diverse audience anyway, because there were no books that spoke directly to Indigenous peoples, especially around these sorts of topics, you know, knowledge, disciplines, um, research, and no books that unequivocally addressed our experiences under imperialism and colonialism. So, you know, I wanted to make that abundantly unambiguous and clear. Um, and I've tried to keep that voice, um, indig an indigenous voice. The third edition, by the way, is coming out soon, I think in May, um, to the book. So it was delayed a bit by COVID. So in terms of advice to collaborators and um, allies and then, so, so as I said, there's always a space, but often it, everything in the indigenous world is about relationships. It's relational. And as you know, relationships are always imbued with power. And so I don't see power as good or bad, but power is power. But how power is wielded 
can be good or bad. And so I think the key thing for non-Indigenous um, allies is to kind of understand the significance of building trusting relationships with people. Um, understanding what it means to support rather than lead, to um, enable or facilitate rather than speak for. And there are, like, there is a book to be written, I think, on allyship, but I'm not the one to write the book. I think if I we imagined it, it would be a collaborative book anyway. But that's not the best use of me. So the best use of me is to write for Indigenous um, researchers and Indigenous peoples, because I can. Thank you, Dr. Smith. I wanted to ask about power relations and oppression that operated before the arrival of European colonizers. And I'm thinking especially of India, where there were communities that were historically marginalized for, for thousands of years. And the colonizers came, that changed power relations in some way. And then they kind of physically left, especially in India, the British left. But the, those marginalized communities continue to stay marginalized. And I was wondering what your thoughts on, are about uh, that kind of those power equations. Sorry, I'm just moving my support system behind me. Um, interesting, I've been to India a couple of times uh, to visit with tribal communities. And, you know, I was, I was kind of surprised, but not surprised that in the Indian constitution it does enshrine these protections for indigenous communities and tribal communities, but in doing so also traps them in a particular model of what it means to be tribal. And, um, you know, one of the big differences I think in terms of our experience in New Zealand, what's happening to our brothers and sisters in India is, you know, we've won the legal battle to develop, to be creative, to redesign ourselves um, and not be governed in these very rigid rules about if you're going to be Indigenous, you have to live like this, eat like this, um, you're not allowed to leave your community or you know be educated in a outside if you if you leave you're you're a goner so I think a number of things I, I learned from from my experience there and and I have traveled to many places and colonialism played out with indigenous communities in really complex ways so in some um, places, you know, some of those smaller indigenous groups were co-opted by imperial power and actually gained quite a lot of status. And so when they left, you know, they left some indigenous communities almost in, in power, or at least they'd risen up the ranks of status. And then others who were seen as criminals, um, who were you know, marginalized even further. And then one of the things that happens in the post-colonial space is you know, once the local communities take over running the government, then they exact punishment on those groups who they thought betrayed them or were or a threat, seen as a threat. So how that plays out across the world is really, interesting. Um, it's still imbued with issues around superiority, racial superiority, linguistic superiority, you know, who's seen as most, um, most likely and most um, 
trying to think of some polite language, you know, most able to be civilized, you know, rise up the hierarchy and those seen as um, still savage fall even further down after, um, after imperial and colonial powers have left. And, you know, for many of our indigenous communities, they're still vulnerable when, or even more vulnerable when, um, you know, when, when post-colonialism kicks in or when the revolution kicks in. So um, if you look to the example of Nicaragua, for example, after the Sandinistas took control of government, uh, were elected into government, you know, they were supported by indigenous communities. And the lesson from there that I thought was very powerful, one of their activists said to me, you cannot trust the left and you cannot trust the right if you are indigenous. Because once the Sandinistas got into power, then they jettisoned all their indigenous support. And the and so indigenous communities, even though they're written into the constitution, are uh, being burned off their lands, being executed, hunted. You know, it is still um, a sort of story of trying to survive when you have no power and no allies, actually. I mean, when I went to Nicaragua, I started to understand why people were turning to some of these fundamentalist Christian religions is because those are the only groups that seem to be operating and a few NGOs to support indigenous communities to try and keep them safe. And so it's kind of ironic, you've got these evangelical Christian groups providing shelter you know, the price of which is you got to convert. But if your village is burned down, you don't have much choice. And the NGOs um, are struggling to survive because the moment they speak out, um, they disappear. Somebody is kidnapped and they disappeared with, you know, so for m most of the world's indigenous populations, Sheer survival is still a priority. And the pandemic has made that even more obvious, like in Brazil and the Amazon and you know other parts of the world where they're excluded from public health strategies. And in fact, I think in Brazil, they're deliberately exposed to the virus, is my take in the Amazon. I mean it's got the worst um, public health kind of strategies. I mean, you can think they're the worst or you can think they're deliberate. Jonathan, do you wanna ask your question next since it's related to COVID? Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Smith, you talked a little bit about New Zealand's uh, I guess, good fortune with dealing, well, I mean, good management, probably dealing with the coronavirus. Um, in the United States, we haven't had the exact same experience. In fact, there's been a, um, some noted disparities in the reaction to COVID in certain communities, as well as disparities in government responses to certain communities in containing and treating the virus. Do you believe that current work by non-Indigenous researchers adequately examines the experience of Indigenous peoples during public crises? And have you seen any ways or methods researchers are recording the experience of indigenous people during the pandemic currently? Those are good questions. Um, I think the fact that in the US they're struggling to reach many communities pretty much answers your question that there isn't enough knowledge or trust in community-based uh, native organizations, for example, to deliver the health messages. And, you know, I think the bigger the country, the more bureaucratic it's going to be anyway. I think our experience here is we have a um, very quickly in, in our crisis, the 
Indigenous health professionals formed an organization and created a website and put up information that started to feed information directly out to our communities. They also responded really intuitively, many of them, to shutting down, locking down the borders of tribes. And this was because we still have powerful memories and oral histories about the 1918 influenza epidemic, which wreaked havoc uh, on our community. So there was a sort of residual memories of that in our, you know, like, like where I'm from, there's a part of our graveyard, which we, we're just taught not to go to because that's where all the victims of the influenza epidemic were buried in a mass grave. So it was always seen as spooky. Um, but those residual memories were enough to really mobilize our tribes really rapidly to put in our own protections and to, while we didn't trust the government 100%, uh, we did trust science. Um, we, and that's because we have our own scientists and health professionals who were able to translate the science messages to our communities. And because they were trusted, the science was trusted. You know, so that capacity in the health area was very important to us. There, um, you know, when I look worldwide at what's happening in terms of delivering um, knowledge about the virus, knowledge about the vaccine, um, science knowledge, if you like, too, hard to reach communities. They have a number of features. You know, one is sort of governments think that, um, it's a one-stop, one model fits all approach. And I think those are the worst models to try and deliver to communities. It's just, you can't do a cookie cutter um, approach to delivering messages. So the science might be fine, but who delivers the science, what messages they give and how they deliver it are all critical for any marginalized communities. Why would they trust the government if the government is the one seen as delivering mostly pain, agony, and punishment? Why would you trust the government? So, you know, having that um, layer of people who are trusted is vitally important. Having people who um, so in my community, having people who understand how to how to deliver, say, a vaccine into a community that also practices Indigenous healing and Indigenous medicine. Um, so what scientists do is say, your medicine, it's useless, it's not science, it doesn't matter, you have to take this. But actually, our medicines are not about treating that particular virus. Our medicines, the philosophy of them, is about whole wellness of the whole person. So they're not just or not even for a specific ailment. They're for someone's emotional well-being, spiritual well-being, um, psychological well-being, cognitive well-being, you know, those sorts of things. And so our specialists know how to deliver the Western medicine message without negating the indigenous health models that we live by. Because our experience with Western medicines is they can often treat one problem and create others in the treatment of one problem or they, they treat one problem and don't treat the whole person. And then they wonder why the one problem wasn't fixed up because the whole person was doing other things as well that sort of negated the treatment. So there's an art 
and a science to working with minority communities. And it's going to differ um, all over the place. And, you know, it's the biggest argument for why we need our own people to be trained, whether it's education, health, business, whatever, because our people can live with the diversity of knowledge, if I put it like that. You know, it's, it doesn't have to be antagonistic. It's having the power to um, make decisions that really matters. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Just one uh, last question before we, uh, because I think we're running out of time now. So I'm extremely inspired and intrigued by the concept of storytelling. And perhaps it's because uh, I belong to the Indian subcontinent where storytelling was, uh, has always been an integral part of the culture. And uh, then you have your Sufis and philosophers like, you know, Rumi and Sheikh Saudi who've used stories to actually build the morals and the values in a society. And they're still being read and followed. Uh, if I look if, uh, at it from a religious uh, standpoint, even then, you know, the stories of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, you know, they were passed down from generation to generation. And uh, they say that if you want to understand what a nation stands for, they listen to the stories that they tell their children. Uh, so you mentioned um, our storytelling as one of your 25 projects in chapter eight. So could you elaborate on its role from your perspective, um, especially in the field of uh, education? Just repeat your question again, the storytelling. Yeah, if you could please elaborate on the role of storytelling uh, from your perspective and how you know we can utilize, especially in uh, the field of education. I think it's all about storytelling. Um, even if you were doing quantitative research, you're still telling a story with numbers. And um, it is powerful but it's, I mean, I, I think in Western culture, the storytelling has been reduced to, it's been reduced to something that's about children. You know, it's a, it's a generational thing. Whereas for us, storytelling is for everyone. Storytelling is how, as you said, you, um, we talk about philosophy. We talk about history. Um, but we also talk about um, moral lessons. Um, it's how we might talk about cooking. Um, it's how we might have a discussion about an incident that happened in the family, you know, that it's wrapped up in stories. And every generation has stories they've inherited and they're going to add to and then there's stories that they create. So we can all be creators of stories, uh, but we're also, we are stories ourselves. We are, we are the embodiment of thousands of years of stories in ourselves. And um, so I think if you sort of put yourself into that context of, you know, we, we are a story, our lives, our being, we, every one of us is a story. Actually, we're multiple stories. And as we live our lives, we live a story, you know, it's a life of story. Um, the older you get, the more stories you can tell. And those stories have multiple purposes. And, you know, I don't think that an academic writer or scholar is any different. I think we learn to tell our stories in an academic genre, um, but there's still stories in the sense of trying to convey deep messages, um, to convey meanings, to communicate, and um, to convince. And, you know, and we speak to an audience. Mm -hmm. We're not speaking to some sort of bland um, virtual world out there. We're actually speaking, you know, when you write something, it's on the understanding that generally someone will read it. When you talk something, it's the understanding that someone will hear it. 
when you play music, it's understanding someone will hear it. You know, so these are the ways, fundamental ways in which humans communicate. And I think every culture and every community has styles of storytelling. You know, even jokes, their stories, you know, humor uh, stories. So, yeah, life is a story. And I think the art for you as students is how you incorporate those understandings. I mean, yes, you can think about them as methods and methodologies, but in your own work when you write, you know, is your writing telling a story? If so, what's the story? You know, if you can sort of break it down to something simple like that. And I, I always recommend to my students that they read a lot of fiction and poetry and learn from those writers how to paint pictures to express express themselves so when someone reads your work they they're moved because they see a picture of the of it and you know avoid being dull uh, that's we all have to do that in our writing. But I think it's really important not to reduce things to this so technical, they're dull. And, and your voice is in how you um, grapple with the technical, but use your voice because your voice is the story voice. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Yeah, that is really profound and definitely storytelling is such a powerful medium. Uh, Dr. Burton and Jones, would you like to um, say something here? Everyone. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. This has been an absolute joy um, to me and I, I'm sure I can speak for the students to say for them as well, or I, I'll let them communicate that themselves. But um, I know that there will be plenty of broken hearts for the folks who were unable to join us today. Um, and so I, I will probably reach out to you to see if, if we can um, perhaps invite you back for a more formal visit um, and some recognition of your time and, and effort. But um, I, I thank you for your work that you do and the work that you've done in the ways that your story will continue to resonate and I know that it will continue to resonate with the, the readers, the students, um, those of us who need to hear your work. So I thank you for being you and for doing the work that only you can do and how you are inspiring us to do the work that only we can do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Jonathan. Oh, no, thank you, Dr. Smith. That's all I have to say. I think everybody wants to say the same thing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your time. Yes. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, this, yeah. We are great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Erica, for joining us and being part of the audience. <laughs> yeah, but thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. And hi, Rira, Dr. Smith. <laughs> Good pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I asked her earlier if I, you know, that's how I should pronounce it. <laughs> right. How was that for you? How was that for you? Great. Yeah. 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 I think I'll stop recording.